Hey, it's a great pleasure to be here with you uh, today. And I, I can't quite see people over here. Bill's over here, I guess, and things. Um, before I get started, I want to make clear that the uh, steering committee and John uh, are very sly people indeed. <laughs> to pair me with Bill as opening keynote speakers is a very deliberate move on their part, because I've got a lot of respect for Bill. I've known Bill for a long time. We were at Martha's Vineyard discussing interaction design back before there was this stuff. And uh, uh, a lot of respect for it, and I appreciate the interface approach he takes, but I've got a quite different take on things. Uh, and so we're going to have some fun discussing that. I've already warned him about that, but, but so I think it's very sly move on your part to, uh, to bring me in. <laughs> I, to begin with, you need to understand that I'm now teaching in a school of management. <laughs> Bad news, it's terrible, I know. But here's what's, here's what's happened. As I've followed out the idea of interaction, one of the branches that I've gone down is a branch of collective interactions. And I remember back at Carnegie Mellon when I was head of the school there, we had a group of students who went down to the city council in Pittsburgh and made a brilliant presentation of a design project, an interactive project. And everyone applauded and thought it was a wonderful project. And they took the students out to lunch, the mayor and the, the city council and the president of the council. And as they were sitting at lunch having a nice food, the uh, uh, president of the council leaned over and said, of course you know it'll never get made. And the students were crestfallen. And they came back to campus and talked with the faculty and said, what happened? They all said it was a brilliant project and no one was going to do anything about it. Why would that happen? At that moment, I realized that we had made a mistake in design education, that there was a missing component that had to be there, that designers had to understand their relationship to organizations. And I say organizations, not just the for-profit side, but the not-for-profit as well, the private and the governmental organizations. So I began teaching courses in design, management, and organizational change as ways of understanding how we can design interactions that affect the way organizations take, take shape. So that's why I'm there, and I needed to explain this. In fact, I, when I went to, uh, to the Weatherhead School of Management, I, I did it kind of quietly and didn't explain to anyone, but now I find these speeches the last couple of years, I'm making this clearer as we go. I hope it's clearer. This chair is here. No. Oh. Okay. Okay. Nice move. <laughs> Uh, Bill will like this very much. Bill will like this. Uh, this is a good physical interface. Um, I, was, I was really happy with yesterday's presentations. Uh, I thought the morning session went really well. There was a subtle kind of critique of this group that worked its way through that, that morning session. Subtle, I don't know if you picked it up very much, just a little bit. Well, I'm going to pick it up more because I think there are some things that we need to talk about fairly seriously in this. And, and, and one of the things that bothered me maybe the most yesterday is there seemed to be uncertainty about who we are. And I don't think we should be uncertain about who we are. Yes! Yes! I like that. Give it. That's it. So what I want to do today is try to explain. Well, I've got three. Another thing. Another footnote. John for months has been saying, Dick, he sent me an email saying, Dick, what's the title of your talk? Give me a, a paragraph describing it. Give me a sentence. Give me a few words for a title, and I did nothing. I'm really rude. <laughs> and, and there was a reason behind this. I'm not negligent. It's just that I, you know, coming to see you, I'm still forming. What do I need to say? What's going to make a difference for this group? What might make a difference? And I found my title. And it's going to be these three, these three things. Who are we? Where are we? And where are we going? Those, my, those are my themes for today. So be patient with me, please. Let me begin by the, the matter of who we are. Um, as head of the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon, we had programs in graphic design, became communication design, industrial design, and then we designed the graduate programs around interaction design. And that's a significant move for us. Um, wow, it's carbonated. This is sparkling. After last night, I don't know. I, I think I need, oh, that's carbonated too. No, they're all carbon. That's okay. That's okay. I don't mind. I had champagne last night, so I'm cool. I'm cool. <laughs> I have what I call the four orders of design. 
It's my way of trying to understand what, what design has been about through the 20th century and as we go into the 21st. To begin with, design has no subject matter. And I, I know that we were struggling yesterday with what's the subject that we... And, and there was a lot of fumbling discussion about this. Let's be clear about this. Design has no subject matter. That is what makes this a powerful discipline. We make our subject matter. You know, if you're in physics, you study matter in motion. And Michael is very good about that. He's a physicist. If you're in psychology, you're looking at behavior and the mind. All the other disciplines have subject matters. We do not. That is significant for us. We make our subject. So, so what I said to myself is, well, if we have no subject matter, how do we get a handle on this, this emerging discipline? There are such disciplines, but how? So I thought, well, there are a series of problems that we've tried to address over the course of the 20th century. Early in the 20th century, we looked at two things, mass communication, mass production. Guess what? Graphic design, industrial design, and the related engineering areas. Two great orders of design. Professions built around it. We know of AIGA and I, uh, IDSA, fine organizations. But long comes the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, and we get tangled into a complication of things that, that were embedded in that, in that earlier notion of design, but never quite fully articulated. Now, I've got to tell you, this is where my respect for Bill comes very, very much forward. Bill had a great understanding that this field we call interaction design comes from information, our ability to communicate, that comes very much out of what we used to call graphic design. Um, Information is important. Also, the whole body experience. And I thought that was a, a, a really inspired insight, that as interaction designers, we're concerned with the whole body, all of our presence. But you know, I don't think that's quite enough yet, because I think that what's happened to us is that we've actually introduced a third new area of problems that we try to solve. It has to do with action. I mean, it's called interaction design for a reason. We design activities, actions, interactions, we call them. Now, uh, there's a mention that in the 80s, the term emerged for the design community. And yes, that's true. That's true. But what's also true is that designers are a good 20 or 30 years behind the intellectual currents of the time. I'm sorry, we are. The first use of interaction in a significant sense in design schools was in the new Bauhaus. John Dewey's uh, Art as Experience, that, that, uh, that pivotal chapter, Having an Experience, the book was written in the mid-30s. Maholi used it as a textbook in its, in its early print form for the new Bauhaus. And in that chapter where the lead word is experience, the second term is interaction, the interaction of the live creature in their environment. It occurs over and over and over in Dewey's presentations. So it's no accident that, uh, that we, uh, we deal with interaction. It was known back then earlier, never quite formed as a whole discipline. We're still handing out some, dealing with some problems in industrial design particularly. But then you come to the issue of computers, machine interfaces, control surfaces. You know these. The early phase of this work, we dealt with interfaces, the interaction with the machine. Where we are today, who we are, we are the designers of the actions and the processes and the experiences of people. There was a debate 10, 12 years ago whether we design experiences or not. I thought it was a fairly tedious debate. Uh, geez, I think we understand what this is about. Uh, but significant. And you now are the second generation of interaction designers. Well, some of you may be first generation, but, but we're all together in this. I, I don't know what generation I am. I'm too far out of anything. I don't know. But, but that's, that's the case. You are pioneers of cultural exploration. Terribly significant for where our world is going. And I don't mean just the, the fancy high-tech world that we live in, but I mean other parts of the world, too. But just as communication design and industrial design are a pair, mass communication, 
mass production, so too interaction has another term. And it's one that surfaced in one of the subsections yesterday, one of the groups. We're dealing with participatory design and things, and I, uh, we had a fairly good audience, but not, not as big as I thought it might be. Now, let me put it this way. The fourth order of design is how we design the environments within which interactions take place. So if you ask me, who are we? To me, we are part of the third great discipline of design to emerge in our time. We deal with interactions. We deal with the actions and processes, the lively experiences of people. Second order design, this is an artifact, a thing, an object. Third order design, we bring a different perspective to our world. The chair is not a thing. The chair is a place of activity. Think about that. Think about the conceptual gap that has to be crossed to think about a chair or any other product as a place of action. I sit in the chair. You're all sitting really calmly. And I, I, but you know, once in a while, I see someone do this, or someone goes a little like this, or this, or, or back. And I like to sit like this, because I, I, I've never fallen over. It's going to happen sometime. But I, it, the point is that we designed the artifact to match the actions, the activities that we perform. That's a big deal. And that's how Bill Stumpf has designed the wonderful chairs that he's designed, and others too. They realize that there is more material to be gathered than just the physical qualities. Now, Bill is sensitive to that. He understands that because he's understood the, the move from physical objects to iconic and symbolic. He's interested in the mind and how it works. This is very good. But I guess for me, I move a little farther down the, the social line. Because action, we didn't say intermotion. We said interaction. And boy, there is a world of difference between motion and action. Rocks move, people act. We act as we form intentions, wishes, plans, goals, and we move into the world. That's why I think action is so significant for us. Yes, we do move, and that's a physical matter, and things, and it's good that we have engineers who can understand this. It certainly makes possible the, the platforms of interaction that we like to carry out. But I guess my interest has moved beyond the interface with things, as important as that is, to the further problems. So, first thing I promise to do when I talk about who we are. Who we are is, let's say we are pioneers of a new discipline of design thinking, a new practice. We are the folks who design interactions and actions of people. Yes, we have platforms in software, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but that's not fundamentally what it's about. Fundamentally, it's about people and their relationships. So if you want a definition of interaction design, and I saw one that was put up on the board, and that one at the bottom looked a lot like, like one I've used before, I'd say interaction is how people relate to other people through the mediating influence of products. And I don't know what a product is. I swear to God, I don't know what a product is. I've got some ideas, but, but think about the course of the meaning of the word product through the 20th century. Early in the first decades of the 20th century, a product was an artifact, a thing. By the end of the 20th century, a product was anything made by a human being. A law, a plan, an organization. Yes, a software piece, video, and uh, I'm doing a great job there, the audio recording. It's anything made by a human being. So interaction is about how people relate to other people through the mediating influence of products. Where are we? We practice in the third great order of design 
But where are we? Two things I think will help us to understand that. First, let's think about what is a product for us. And I want to be real careful yesterday. Uh, yesterday we had some conversation about what are the materials of interaction. Oh gosh, I'm going to pick up on that one for sure. Because I liked Bill's answer very much. The material that has to do with the, with the systems and the people interacting in the systems. Is this, is this correct? It's the systems notion. Yeah, it's enough for right now. Hey, we'll have further conversation on this one. You wanted a, a, a debate. You wanted a lively discussion. <laughs> But the other, the other replies, I had some trouble with. I thought they were fumbling some, and they shouldn't have been. So I want to try to clarify that a little bit. Let's begin with this. Where are we? Well, we make products. As uh, someone yesterday mentioned, if we're not making something, we're not designers. The trick is, what are we? Oh, OK. Yes, you're happy, aren't you? This is a happy man over here. Well, I'm glad, too, because I'm happy, because sometimes we forget it. And I'll tell you where I'm at right now with the weatherhead. They don't yet quite understand always that we make products, and they don't always realize that they make products in organizations. Although I, I do want to tell you that the economists in our school have become rather intrigued by design. And they're starting to ask difficult questions like, what were the design of those financial instruments that brought about the economic collapse? What design process wasn't followed? And what would design have to say about a proper formation of financial products? A non-trivial question with big honesty. implications. Honesty would have helped, wouldn't it? Hey, but honesty's not quite enough. Oh, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, my students at uh, Carnegie Mellon, they, they, they were kind of cruel to me. They were really, they were really cruel. I, I, uh, I developed two tools to try to figure this, this stuff out. And I, one was what they came to call the triangle of doom. And they would be in the hall, and they would go like, Ooh. and I, here's what the triangle of doom is. It's now public, so what the hell? Everybody at Case knows about these two. It just drives me nuts. Um, the triangle of doom is my way to try to understand what a product is. A product has these three features. And, and you know this through the usability literature. It's got to be useful, which means it has to have an intellectual content. It's got something. It does some work. Whether it's a chair or a piece of software on a subject, whatever, there's some intellectual content. That makes it useful, potentially. It's got to be usable, so usability comes in. And it's got to be desirable. This is the triangle of doom. And how they're all balanced, that tells you what the product is. So useful, gosh, who owns that? The content specialists, in some cases the engineers, where the content is at stake, somebody's got to figure it out. The architecture of that knowledge. The usability, we turn towards social sciences for that work. And I gave a keynote at, uh, at the uh, Usability Professionals Association some years ago. And it was a closing keynote. And they had uh, 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 Jacob Nielsen there. And I was there. And I thought I was going to get killed. I thought, oh my god, they're going to just love Nielsen. And they're going to just hate me. Turned out it was exactly the opposite. <laughs> exactly the opposite. And here's why. Because they had learned all the usability research tools, but they didn't understand how it fit together in the bigger task of design. I thought it was wonderful that they were concerned to know that that work has to integrate into the, well, the triangle of doom. And they embraced that rather, rather well. I, I must say I have a lot more respect for them these days. Uh, but this third one. The desirability. Boy, that gets a strange rap. I know I was at uh, Microsoft a number of years ago and uh, speaking on desire and a huge audience. And the design group, of course, knew what it was about. But everybody else was vastly puzzled. And when all the program managers came in the back door just before I started, about 20 or 25 of them, uh, it, it was a strange moment. And, and I want you to understand what we mean by desirability. Because it's not this silly notion of, well, you know the silly notion. It's, it's this. To what degree do we identify with the product that's made? Can we identify with it? And believe me, if we don't identify with a product, it ain't coming into our lives. We need to identify with it. It needs to speak in a voice that fits our, our 
our, our mind? No, that's usability. It's got to fit our circumstances of living, where we're at, the culture we're in. Hey, anthropologists contribute to understanding desirability. If you can combine these three things, a product that will hold together and not fall down, that's got a kind of reasoning, a technological reasoning, wonderful, but that's not a product. If you add to it usability, it fits my hand, my mind, oh, damn. Then you got a product? No, not quite. The marketers think that's a product, but they don't quite get this. If you add to it a voice, that it speaks in a voice that I'm willing to bring into my life, you put those three together in a balance, you got a product. You got a product. A tough thing to balance them all. Think about the fireman's uniform. Fireman's uniform. Well, it's got to be really useful. The technological reasoning of a fireman's uniform has got to be there solid. It's got to withstand heat, got to watch out for water. You know how that hat goes down the back? That keeps the embers and the hot water from going down the neck. It's got to have this reasoning straight, the right materials. It's got to be usable because in a dark room with smoke, you've got to be able to reach and know there's a flashlight here, there is a, a hammer here, there is a cutter here. You need to find it. You know, have you ever thought about why firemen's uniforms are the way they are, why they look the way they look, sometimes with little epaulets or sometimes other little features or flare here. You build an ethos. The uniform has to have a quality of ethos that you want to be part of. Oh, God, what a tough design challenge that is. It's got to have the right ethos that fits the situation. So you're part of a team, a, a member of a group, Contrast that with haute couture. Haute couture. Uh, the technological reasoning of a, of a fancy ball dress, a gown. My wife will tell me about these things, won't you, Kaya? Yeah. It's got, it, typically, women's clothing is not very well designed. A lot of it, you know. Is this true? Oh, she's got, she's got it right there. Look at the shoes. Yes, yes, yes. But, but lots of little things. Zippers don't work. There isn't quite the right sewing of this. But, you know, is it useful? Well, it, it, you can keep it on for a while. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what am I going to do? Oh, my God. This is a big mistake. <laughs> I meant it'll survive an evening. <laughs> How many times do you wear a gown? How many times? I don't know. <laughs> All right, I like this. I feel home, by the way, with this group. I really do. I interact. I speak to so many other groups, but this is good for me. I feel like I'm with, with the right folks. Usability? Eh, marginal for the gown. Enough to get it on without the zipper jamming or whatever, or the hooks. Desirability, whoa, way high. That flare of material and form, that's got to be just right. So that balance between the fireman's uniform and the haute couture gown is the difference. So you find the balance of what is useful, usable, and desirable. These words come from Liz Sanders, and I got a lot of respect for Liz. I have a slightly different set. But the, I use logos, ethos, and I'm a teacher. Logos, ethos, and pathos. That's my triangle of doom anyway. So we make products, and we have to bring together knowledge from those three big areas. The technological reasoning, whether it's a content specialist or an engineer or whatever it may be. Usability, which comes from cognitive psychology and other forms of psychology social psychology, for instance, and desirability from, well, frankly, from the art community, because they have a sense sometimes of the voice in which products may speak, the qualities of style and beauty sometimes, not always, but sometimes. But in the middle, that balance, the middle of the triangle of doom is that balance. That belongs to design. So yeah, we need the knowledge from the other fields, but we have to have the grasp of how they fit together in a balance. 
That's where we are. We integrate this. But now it gets tough. Now it gets tough. And I've got to talk to you about the group and what I saw yesterday and what I see we're at. Because there are different ideas about what interaction is. And that question about what are the materials, the proper answer would have been, the materials depend on what you think is interacting. And we've got to think carefully about that and keep our minds open to the diversity of possible meanings. Because frankly, the field you know today will not be the same field in 10 years, maybe not in five. Prepare yourself for a ride. So what I'm going to say is this. Now comes the cross of pain. <laughs> we are still trying to track down the smart-ass student that came up with these phrases. We've narrowed it down to the first two classes at Carnegie Mellon, maybe, yeah. That's okay. Here's what I do with the cross of pain. It's my way of trying to distinguish different perspectives on any subject, but in this case, interaction design. I want to say, are there different ways to think about a subject? I hate the notion that there's one vision only. There are not, there's not one vision. We're a pluralistic world and a pluralistic community. Our strength lies in that pluralism. So one, one place, if you think of the question of interaction, break it down into its parts. What is interacting? How does an interaction take place? And to what end or purpose? Those are the questions that we should be considering. And there won't be one answer. Oh, the broad sense that we're designing actions and interactions. Yeah, that's comfortable. That's what we share in common. But the diversities give us rich imagination. It's the, it's the, it's the diversity of our gene pool. One answer to this is that what is interacting are things, entities, material interactions. We call that interfacing. When the thing is a computer or a control surface, and the thing is this animal we call human being, that animal interaction requires an interface, and this machine adapts to that machine. Now, I know that's a little bit of a bastardization, but not too far. Not too far. And this is where a lot of subtle thinking is required. That hypothesis was developed, I thought, brilliantly by, by Bill, and it's one of the foundations of our field, an understanding of that material substructure of work. But you know, it didn't take very long for us to realize that it's not thing to thing or person to thing, it's person to person. And a lot of us began to look at Irving Goffman and the relations of communication and social interactions, and we started to say that's a transaction, that we design products that facilitate transactions. And yeah, there's software involved and there may be physical objects involved, like this room, but it's the transaction, that's, that's, where the, that's where the juice is. That's the sweetness. It's all about people to people. In fact, there's a whole theory of this in Goffman. In fact, I'd like to play this out. This discussion of what is the material, uh, we've got to add to that what is form. And I don't know how many of you have read Goffman. How many of you have read Goffman? Ooh, way painfully small number. This is scary almost. He's got a piece called Facial Engagements, another called uh, Ritual Interactions. They're all about the social interactions that we design for. And my God, on the web, we're designing social interactions. There's a person behind the screen and there's a person in front of the screen and the screen is just there to mediate that relationship. And so for Goffman, the form of an interaction is inauguration, maintenance, and leave-taking. Inauguration is when you come and say, oh, hi, MK, how are you doing? Good to see you. A human being begins some communicative act, the, what Goffman calls the presentation of self in everyday life. But, you know, we don't walk away from those always. We have to maintain them. 
So we say, uh, uh, it's a great conference. I have to say this is one of the best design conferences I've been at. It's designed really well. Yeah, I think it deserves that applause. I know, I know, yeah. Uh, I'd say, uh, gosh, look at this conference and look at the social interactions we have going on. You know, the website is wonderful, it's spectacular, best job I've seen for a conference, but the social interactions of this whole conference have been wonderfully managed. Cool stuff. And so I did, did a great job. Uh, are you tired now? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Me too, a little bit, but I'm having fun right now. This is maintenance. You do little bits of business to keep that interaction going. And then, I'll see you later, I gotta get back to the speech. So long. <laughs> Leave taking. That's the structure of an interaction for Irving Goffman and for a lot of interaction designers. Yeah, we do the bits and the bites, but we do it to facilitate social interaction. Cool stuff. Here's the trick. At some point, designers began to realize that it's not just interfacing, not just transactions, but in a sense it's a human being interacting with their environment. Environment, what does that mean? Jesus. Their cultural environment, their political environment, intellectual environment, that there's some content on the other side that's at stake. I don't go to your goddamn websites just to see the clicks and the pretty colors. I go there because I've got something I need to do. And I expect the design to follow that matter. I expect you to pay close attention to the content. I like to teach with my students, I, I used to teach a, per, a, a little piece of software called How Many Bugs in a Box. Now, be honest, do any of you know this from childhood? It was a pop-up book, oh yes, it was a pop-up book and then a brilliantly designed piece of interactive software. The subject is how to count. It teaches kids, young kids, how to count. It teaches them what a number is. The subject is mathematics. And the thing is designed brilliantly with a respect for the content. What's the form of that interaction? Initiation? Well, initiation is something people do. But suppose you follow Dewey's formulation as he lays it out in having an experience which is more of a foundation for your work than you begin to know. I don't think you realize how deep that, that essay runs. He says, inception, development, fulfillment. Oh, a world of difference. Inception is when the live preacher comes to a situation and environment has a problem that needs to be solved, wants to know something, to do something, to learn something. Those terms that Bill was using that I respect so much, those terms. We come with a reason. Now, maybe it's play. Dewey's not a dull guy. Nor were they dull at Xerox Park when they were reading Dewey. But that's a different kind of matter. It's a matter of saying it's not just the little gestures of, oh, communication, social, hey, how are you doing? That's cool. What are you doing? So long, I've got to go now. It's about there's something I need to know, and so you better think carefully about the content and structure that experience so I get what I need logically and it's fulfilled. Example, compare the Mayo Clinic website, compare that with, guess what, WebMD. I recommend that you go and compare those two sites with regard to content and style of presentation. The Mayo Clinic is brilliantly designed, but around the content. I heard a story yesterday from someone who regards themselves as a, as a content strategist. I don't know where you're at, but I really like that conversation with you. You're not going to volunteer, are you? No, she's going to. Oh, there you are. There you are. There actually exist. And she told me the story of, of designers bringing her in very late in a project development process to work out the content matters after they had done the wireframes. <sighs> Jesus Christ. Designers for a long time have been complaining about being brought in too late in product development, and now they turn around and do the same damn thing to their own folks, saying, oh, we'll do the design, and then you bring in content. <laughs> Jesus. This third mode of interaction, first, this third way of interacting, got to think about what that means. It's a powerful concept, but not so much present in this group yet. But it will be. 
There is a fourth. How am I doing? Doing good, doing good, good. All right. There is a fourth kind of interaction. And this one's, this one's a little tougher to explain. We saw some flashes of it yesterday. Carl, your stuff was doing it. And I thought the stuff from uh, Kenya, uh, Eric, where are you at, Eric? I thought your stuff was what I would call fourth order design. Maybe the best example I can give is a story. I, a number of years ago, I was in New York and I was giving a, a speech with another guy and there were about 200 people in the audience. I, I, it was just some thing. I, I don't know what it was exactly. And um, I gave my speech, and then he got up and gave his. And we're sitting at the front, and it's getting late in the afternoon, and people are, you know, it's New York. 200 people ready to run. <coughs> and he calls for questions. His story, he was actually a, an anthropology student at Delft, and he was also an assistant director for the Museum of Civilization in Canada used to be called the Museum of Man, but they, they wised up to that cultural problem. And he said that uh, the elders of a tribe came to him one time and said, uh, we would like to have the artifacts back that have been collected in this museum. And you know what the museums have done around the world. They've pulled artifacts out of their natural environment and tucked them away into cupboards and drawers and so forth. And he said, I'd like to have the artifacts back. And the, in the speech, in the presentation, uh, he reported this and uh, went on his way. But after the speech, as we're sitting there and he's calling for questions, I, I raised my hand and said, can I ask you a question? And he said, yeah, sure. So I said, when you told your story, you told it like an anthropologist. I said, you told it real cool and straight. But when you got to that point of the elder asking you for the artifacts, Something was in your voice. It was a kind of a funny catch in your voice. I said it wasn't much, and you may not want to talk about it, but I thought there was something about the way you... You didn't feel quite comfortable. Could you tell me what was going on? Well, we sat there for about 10 seconds, and 10 seconds in New York is like an hour in Boulder. <laughs> People are going, oh, Jesus. And then he started to talk, and he said, yeah, I will tell you. And he said, when the man came, he, he asked for the artifacts, and he said, we're not sure that the artifacts will speak to us any longer. And we're not sure that we can listen and hear what the artifacts have to say. The room got frozen silent because it was so powerful to see both Will they speak to us, and will we hear what those artifacts have to say? The artifacts of the tribe. And we started to talk about that. Why wouldn't they speak to you? Well, they're distant now. They're not, they're not part of us. Or maybe we're not part of them anymore. A real, a real human dilemma. And, you know, it started a conversation among these 200 people about what it is to participate. And they started talking about New York, all the different racial and ethnic types, and blah, 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 different economic groups. And, but they started talking about what is it like to participate in New York, to feel like a New Yorker. And they suddenly got that notion that some people can participate and some can't. And being able to participate is a really big deal. How do you design for participation so that people feel part of a bigger whole? That's the fourth kind of interaction. It's, we're right at the edge of it in some of the presentations, some of the work being done. It's powerful stuff. It's what I call fourth order design. And it has to do with the design of the environments. And yes, I'll say the systems, perhaps the organizations, that wholenesses within which we participate. How do we design those? Um, I. Uh, one of the gurus of marketing is named uh, Philip Kotler, and Phil, Phil is a really good guy. He's up at Northwestern at Kellogg, and years ago, Victor Margolin and I put on a conference called Design at the Crossroads up there. We got a call from, from Phil saying, uh, I'd like to, like to come and participate in your, in your conference. There were like 12 people going to be there, 15 maybe. And he said, yeah, okay, come and join us. And we went on for like two and a half days, and he was there from 
sunrise to sunset each day. Now this guy gets $25,000 an hour for his lectures. <sighs> Believe me, he is, he is the founder of marketing. He is the guru. But for all day, all day, and I wouldn't even want to calculate the money he would, <laughs> but he wanted to understand design better. Now I found an article from him called Humanistic Marketing. And in that article, he identifies four relations of customers to the companies with which they deal, and organizations generally, I suppose. The first three kinds of relationships you can guess, you can imagine. But there is a fourth kind of relationship that's very puzzling, hard to achieve, but with immense significance. It's the, it's the kind of relationship that occurs when there is no outsider and no insider, when the customer is part of the company. Now, with your minds, the way we work, it doesn't make any sense. It sounds really stupid. But there are some places that do think about customers as being part of the company. That the organization is broader than just the workforce. That is a very powerful kind of interaction to accomplish if you can pull it off. There are a few places, a few companies that do it. It's an unusual approach to interaction. It involves components that I won't even go into. But when I say, where are we? I guess I'm asking you to consider yourselves nailed on the cross of pain and tell me which of these approaches is most comfortable to you. Are you a thing-to-thing -thing or person-to-thing interaction designer? Are you a person-to-person -person designer? Are you a person-to-environment, whether it's cultural environment or natural science environment or political environment, some engagement of that sort? Or are you a participatory designer? My read of this community is that we have started from the person to thing side of it, and that we are by gentle steps recognizing that we design for people and their interactions and communications. I think that was a great deal of the burden of Bill's presentation, what that move across would mean in terms of the material substructures, which is why I have such high regard for the work that you do. But these gentle steps in this community, slowly seeing that maybe it's this awareness of people. There's a different body of literature that you might read, and you might be really surprised by it. And then you get to those companies, and there are some that know how to deal with content matters. They know that information architecture is shaped around the, the tasks and needs of a person, that we come to these interactions with reasons in mind, and we need to fulfill those in many ways, intellectually, emotionally. But I think where we are as a community is that we're just starting a pathway, and it's a really good idea, it's a really good idea to think of ourselves as the early phases, the nascent form of interaction because we aren't where we're going to be in five or ten years. We're going to be changing that, and we'll see more of a mixture of types of interaction. There'll be new people who will participate with us. Oh, yeah, participate. I guess that maybe that's what it means. There'll be new people join us, and we'll be doing new things. The products may not look familiar. The products may be distressing. It's more than the physical chair. Uh, it's more than the chair as a site of interaction. But how this chair fits in the environment of our room right now, it's actually a rather good chair. I'll take one home with me. I, <laughs> I like the cups at the hotel. They're really cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a couple of those. I'll buy those. <laughs> I will buy those, man. Who are we? Where are we? I give you my sense of where we are, but you have to make that decision yourself. Which of these modes? And you know, they're not totally exclusive of each other. They slide gently into the other, and we don't have the language for where we move with our design work, and we need to find it, because I found the conference yesterday struggling to find its language. That's cool. We're getting there. But the last theme, the last part of the theme, where are we going?
I enjoyed yesterday's morning session with the lightning presentations. I thought that uh, uh, the person who spoke about uh, um, action, balance, and creativity, where are you, Tim? Tim, was it Tim? Yeah, it was yours. Peter, yes. Uh, as soon as I got the iconic, you know, yeah, I got it, I got it. <laughs> I, I, I like that. I, I like that presentation a lot because, you know, what you, st I don't know if you're aware of this, and I'll be a little bit condescending here because I've I, I got gray hair, I can do that. You were stumbling, <laughs> bullshit, <laughs> you were stumbling toward principles. You know, this is a community that's got lots of techniques, lots of methods, but I'll tell you, you ain't yet got the discipline, the overall strategic guidance of all the parts that come together. That's what we're working out now. That's why these conferences are so significant, to lay the foundations for this, because this is a non-trivial e effort we're moving into. But you were fumbling toward principles. Principles are more than the techniques and the methods and the bits of business. It had to do with why we do things, the reasons. I'd say you, you gave a good anecdote for it. Your, your story was good. I, I like that. It was a Goffman-esque story, by the way. I don't know if people realize that, but it was a Goffman-esque. Do you read Goffman? No? Damn, you've got a treat in store for you. It's like, it's like stumbling on some old movie from the 30s and say, I've never seen that, you know, how great it is that I, I can see that. There aren't many left that I can see, but that's one. But you were stumbling toward principles, and we need to understand what principles are in this community. Principles are the foundations, the values, the reasons why we do what we do. They, they're what organize our work and give it significance. And we're struggling to find those principles. I wasn't totally happy with what you, pre you presented. You weren't either, I think. You weren't either. It was an instinct of dissatisfaction. And you know, I thought throughout that morning session there was a quiet subtext of critique for what we're doing. I don't know if other people felt that in the audience, but I thought there were wonderful presentations, but a subtle sense of maybe not all is right. And I thought yours was an honest portrayal of an encounter you've had and an effort to deal with it. I've also dealt with those things, and they're, they're hard in the field, but we need the language for how to deal with our values. And uh, to accept that there are many versions of values in the world, many, many kinds. Well, I won't be coy about this. I'll be very direct about it. For me, the principle behind interaction design, no, the principle behind all design, for me, is human dignity. We are here to support dignity for the people we serve. George Nelson has done a wonderful article on design as social communication. I doubt if anybody knows about that. I don't think this audience doesn't know much about the history and theory of design, do you? The literature there. You've got to take some time to read some of this stuff. George Nelson, ah, oh, geez, Nelson's a cool guy. He says, we have a very modest profession. We're not Jesus Christ. We're not high-level philosophers. We I mean, talk philosophy sometimes, but we're not really philosophers. He said, we're, we're down here at a very humble profession. We, we, we serve people. Our job is to serve people, help them do what they want to do. And I guess for me, that means supporting the dignity of human beings. If you ask me how is what we do different from what other people have done who have put together products in the past, I think part of the package we bring as designers is an awareness of the dignity of human beings. To support that dignity. <laughs> Let me come right to this point. Because when the question was asked, what is the material of interaction design, I cringed with uh, several of the answers. I thought, gosh, you can do a lot better. Here's the thing. I think the material of interaction design are the purposes and desires of the people we serve. That comes to us as clay, and we form that clay. We shape and express, give deep endurance to the purposes and values of other people. That's why sometimes in a design project we say, 
I won't take that on. I don't want to do that. So if we don't have a subject matter, maybe the closest thing to it is understanding the desires, needs, wishes of the people we try to serve. That's not an ass-kissing mode. That's an appreciation and a deep resonance with what we think people want to accomplish in their lives. Now, yeah, I, I understand very well about the, uh, the material side, the bits and bites, the, the granite and the marble and the steel and the, and the colors and the... I know all about that stuff. You know, I, I've been there. Those are the vehicles. Those are the vehicles for carrying what it is that we design. Our material are the purposes and needs of people we serve. We give shape to that through forms of experience. And the materials may come from, well, each of the notions of interaction that we have. If it's a thing-to-thing -thing interaction, then yeah, it's a material, uh, material, physical material. Material materiality, whatever the hell. <laughs> but if it's, if it's the relation to person to person, well, maybe it's the signs and symbols of communication, those subtle gestural matters that, that tell us. And if it's content, maybe it's other things. Gosh, the range is there. But I think if we don't design with dignity as our goal, and, and I, I want to be cautious, because I'm not going to lay this on you. you there, are other, there are some other good candidates Another candidate is justice. We design for the purpose of justice. And the justice we deliver is not rectificatory, punishing the evil. It's distributive justice to bring the benefits of our clear thinking and the work of our companies to a wider audience so that all people can participate. Justice is a cool end. Another end is good design. God, the history behind good design is just dreadful goes back so far. But what I mean by good is helping people find their natural, proper place in the cosmos. We design to help people become part of the cosmos. Some people believe that. And I don't mind having a good conversation with those folks. I'll argue dignity, justice, I want to hear what you have to say because I may learn something. What is good, I like that kind of conversation if it's smart. Maybe even just useful. But for me, I guess it's human dignity. And I guess one of the things that I've appreciated so much about this conference is the sense of dignity in this, in this whole enterprise. You've really treated people well. You've treated them like human beings. And that's cool. Hey, thank you very much.